us bow our heads a moment. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity for us to celebrate the life of a great Bahamian, a great friend, a great husband, a great father. And Father, as we acknowledge his passing and prepare to deliver his remains to the grave, we just thank you for his life. We thank you for what he brought to all of us. And Father, I just thank you for using me today to say a word of encouragement, of hope, of inspiration that would cause us all to be reminded of who we are in you and the opportunities that we have in this life. And we just thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit being present to guide us and direct us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. First of all, on behalf of my wife and I and the entire BFM family, we extend our condolences to Rosella, Phyllis, Dion, Alexis, Etta, and all of the remaining siblings and family members. We are here to commemorate the passing of a great Bahamian icon and legend. The Ambrista family has been a big part of BFM. Mom and Dad, Ambrista, Dad and Bristol worked here at the ministry for many, many years. And all of the siblings that we just mentioned um, attended here, were integral parts of the ministry. And Jessica in Freeport at our Freeport church. So they have been a tremendous blessing to us as a church, as a church family, and I'm sure to many of you here in the Bahamas. I personally have a long connection to the Ambrista family. Beginning many years ago as a teenager, when I was a young boy, my friend, my high school friend, uh, Valentine, we used to call him Kentuck Hyler, we, we became friends and Every day after school, I would end up in Harlem, and we used to hang out in Harlem on a regular basis. And it was during that time, my time in Harlem, that I got my first connection to the Ambrista family through Johnny. Johnny and I were friends, and we shared some of the familiar adventures of Harlem. Things like food store inventory acquisition. <laughs> I actually got my diploma in shooting dice. I got my associate degree in the pharmaceutical industry. I got another degree in botanical science. <laughs> Those were some interesting days. I tell people, I said, you know, I went to three universities, two universities before I left my teenage years. One was the University of Warren Street, and then the other one was the University of Harlem, sometimes referred to as the HIT, Harlem Institute of Tuggery. <laughs> We had many professors back in those days. We had people like professors like Schaff, Nugget, <laughs> Sieg. <laughs> but it was a great time. We, we enjoyed that time. And baseball was a big part of Harlem. 
You know, I remember growing up and um, there were many, many baseball legends from Harlem, including Tony P. 24, Poker Hyler. You had Dawn Taylor. You had Johnny C. Egg, Reds, Rat, Sissy, and all the others. The one thing about the Harlem crew is that they normally had two wins in baseball. They would win the game and then win the fight too. <laughs> Ambry was a celebrity in Harlem. I remember in those early days, I heard a lot about him. I met him occasionally, but there was an age difference. And so we weren't personal friends at the time. But he was a celebrity in Harlem, and everybody talked about his baseball exploits. I remember getting to know him much better when he came to BFM. And we began to talk about baseball, because I was a baseball aficionado back in the day as well, played baseball. We started to talk a lot about baseball and then about life and, and different things. And then I had occasion where I had some young men who wanted to go to college. And I remember this one particular occasion, I talked to Ambry and I said, you know, Ambry, I need a, a recommendation for this guy. He, the, the school wants to offer him a scholarship, but they are not sure what level he plays at. So I called Ambry and then I called the coach and Ambry said, tell the coach that the Bahamian Baseball League that he played in is equivalent to the minor leagues. He said anywhere from single A to double A. So when I called the coach back and I told the coach who my reference was, he said, what? Oh yeah. He was ready to give that young man a scholarship. He also did some work for me from time to time and every now and then, we would have to go back through the corner, pick up stuff. But the interesting thing about Ed, or Ambry as I know him, was that he was the first of a very, very small group. There was Ed Ambrista, then there was Michael Thompson, there was Rick Fox, and then Clay Thompson. These are Bahamians with world championship rings. So he was truly a part of a very rare group. And sometimes, you know, we do celebrate our heroes and sometimes we forget our heroes. We forget their accomplishments. And I pray that at some point in time, a book, a movie, or something is done so that we can truly have his memory immortalized and Bahamians for generations can know who it was that passed this way. Anybody in agreement with me? <laughs> One of the most famous, or probably the most famous, incident of Ed's life was the 1975 World Series. And I remember many of us, we watched that series and we saw that famous bunt, the bunt heard around the world, that potentially changed the series, made a difference between them winning the championship and not winning the championship. In fact, many Boston Reds fans, when I tell them I'm the, from the Bahamas and I know Ed and Brister, they want to curse me. <laughs> They were like, man, that do it. <laughs> if it wasn't for that bunt. <laughs> but he has a place in history. And when you think about the company that he kept at that time, you had legends like Pete Rose, Joe Morgan, Johnny Bench, and Ken Griffey Sr. One of the good things that I can say about 
add is that after he returned home, he decided to give back in terms of mentoring young men. And many young men, I'm sure, can testify. I was talking with Jeff Francis, and Jeff was telling me the work that Ed, along with himself and others, did in, in terms of mentoring young men. And I say that is commendable. I, I think we should give him a round of applause for that. In the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. And that's what he did. He gave back to his community. For many years, he was a part of this church here. He sat right over there to my right when we had conferences faithfully on Sunday mornings. And I'm thankful that he came to a point where he decided to give his life to Christ. And I think of all the things that he achieved in life, that's probably the most, not probably, that is the most important achievement. So today we celebrate Ed, we celebrate his accomplishments. But my question today is not about him anymore, it's what about you? Life is unpredictable. I mean, life is really un unpredictable. A year ago, if you went in a bank with a mask, you would get locked up. This year, if you go in the bank without a mask, you get locked up. <laughs> Things change in life so quickly and so suddenly. None of us know how much time we have. You know, I always say that you go in the food store and you pick up a bottle of milk and it has an expiry date. So after this date, you know it's finished. But we are born with a born date, but none of us know our expiry date. So I want to ask you today, the question, what about you? What have you done with your time? The time that you have available to you, and I can't tell you how much time you have. I can only tell you that you have now. You don't have tomorrow. You hope you have tomorrow. You believe you have tomorrow. It may be even likely that you have tomorrow, but tomorrow is not guaranteed. So use your time wisely. And my question again is, what about you? Well, my main reference when I ask that question, what about me, is that I want to give you a, an insight into my life. You know, I, I grew up very adventurous. As you would have heard, I had an interesting and a colorful background. And it's very possible that my life could have ended up sh uh, much shorter. It's very possible that I could have ended up in jail. But I made a critical decision many years ago, and that decision turned my life around. And so when I ask the question today, what about you? I can only tell you about me. And my decision to accept Christ into my life changed my trajectory. It changed everything in my life. When we look at the Bible, the Bible is a book of interesting and contrasting statements. There's a scripture in the Bible that says this. It says, man born of woman is few of days and full of trouble. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting observation to make about life? Few days full of trouble. And then Jesus comes along and says, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So we have these contrasts. We have few days full of trouble. And then Jesus comes along and says, even if you have few days, and even if they are full of trouble, you can still have abundant life. Anybody know what I'm talking about? 
There's a way to live life full. There's a way to enjoy, enjoy the journey and have no regrets. And I found that way. What about you? I believe that God wants the best for us. You know, when we think about who we are, sometimes if somebody asks you who you are, you may say, well, my name is so-and-so, or I was born in such and such a place. But that's not really who you are, you know. Your name is a label on your house. The community that you were born in, that's just a location. But who you really are, is found in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah said this, it says, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. So in other words, you, are, you come through your parents, but you are not from your parents. You actually come from God, and you come from God with an assignment and a program. When you think about it, a sperm is invisible to the naked eye, but it has all of your characteristics in it. Your speech, your language, your eye color, all of these things are in this tiny thing that you can't see. How does it get there? It has to be programmed. Who could program it? Only God. So God has written a program on you. But what happens in life is that most of us never discover what God wrote about us. I thank God that I've discovered what he, what he has written about me. And I encourage you today to discover what he has written about you. I can tell you what he didn't write about you. He didn't write that you're supposed to be on drugs. He didn't write that you're supposed to be on jail. He didn't write that you're supposed to be immoral or unfaithful or crooked or any of those things. I don't believe that any of those things are written in the program about your life. So you have to discover what is your original programming. Tell the person next to you, say, what about you? Jesus made another interesting statement that I want us to pay attention to. He said these words. He said, these things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So Jesus came, God in the flesh came and told us, he said, look, this world is full of trouble and full of problems. He said, but stick with me and it's going to be all right. That's, that's kind of a rephrasing in it. And I found that formula to work. I don't know about you. I'm just telling you what I found that works for me. And I'm sure there are many, many other people in here who can testify to. Do I have any witnesses in this place today? Another scripture in the Bible makes an interesting statement. It says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So this scripture is telling us that the bodies we live in are like tents. What is a tent? A tent is a temporary structure. It's never meant to be permanent. But it says there's a part of you that's not temporary, and that's the part that you have to pay attention to. You know the temporary part? You have to keep it together so you can stay here. But the eternal part is the real key to your destiny. Jesus put it this way. He said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? You know who's the most irrelevant man in the world? A rich man in the graveyard. Totally irrelevant. Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? But then he showed us a way to have both. It's not either or. You can gain whatever you qualify for in life. 
and then you can enjoy the process. You don't have to go through pain. You know, life is beautiful and exciting amidst all the trials, all of the things that we go through. Life is still beautiful. You know, people sometimes talk to me and they talk about how hard things are and all of these problems. And then I say, do you realize you live in the Bahamas? You ever walk down to the beach? When you go on the beach, it don't look like any problems out there. It's a beautiful country. You see, it's as beautiful as we are on the inside. When we're not beautiful on the inside, everything looks terrible. But when you clean up the inside, everything outside looks much better. Amen. The thing about it, about life, is that the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the interesting thing about the wages of sin is the wages of sin is death, but you pay the price long before you die. So you have to make the right choices. Again, what I, I say today, what about you? Think about this. Eternal life is free. Coming to church is free. Salvation is free. God's love is free. You have to buy a cigarette. You have to pay a prostitute. You have to buy alcohol. You have to pay the entrance fee to get into a nightclub. And we spend our lives paying for things that kill us when the things that give us life are free. So my question again is what about you? Remember this today, your choices determine your destiny. Where you are today is the sum total of your choices. Now your circumstances may affect your choices, your environment may affect your choices, but at the end of the day, it's still your choice. One thing that God does, and I appreciate what I, what I appreciate about God is God speaks to our potential and our purpose rather than our problems. You know, sometimes we want to go to God with excuses. We say, God, you know, I can't do this. I can't do that. And in the Bible, there are some characters who tried to give God excuses. Moses said, well, you know, God, um, I, I can't speak. I stutter. And God said, okay, you can't speak or stutter, but what's that you have in your hand? Moses said, man, all I got is stick. God said, okay, well, we'll work with the stick. And you see, you may not have a lot to offer God, but whatever you have to offer him, he can work with that. So never think of your problems. Think of your purpose and your potential. There are many days in life that we have to think about. We have birthdays, we have holidays, there's Mother's Day, there's Father's Day, there's Boxing Day, there's all kind of days. But one day that we don't think about that's just or more important than all of these other days. You know what that day is? It's called Judgment Day when you are required to give an account for what God gave you. Because you see, everything that he gave you, that's his gift to him. What you do with it, that's his gift to, to, to you. What, what you do with it is your gift back to him. If you want to be depressed, live in the past. If you want to be anxious, live in the future. If you want peace and you want to be content, live in the present and maximize the moment that you have. In life, we have many options, but I encourage you today to stick with the best option. And that's the option that I found. And what I found that the option that I chose is a winning option. And if you play sports, you know it's about winning. We all, that, that's why we play. We play to win. 
But if you play sports to win, why not play life to win? So many people, they play hard to win a game, but they don't play hard to win at life. But life is much more important than a game. And when you think about winning, I want you to think about winning on three levels. Level one is you go and become a winner yourself. Level two is you come back and you help someone else win. And then level three is you watch the people that you helped help someone else win. But it all begins with you making the right choice. I want to encourage you today to ask this question and answer this question today. What about you? I want you to, to, to say this, repeat this with, with me, to say this to yourself, say, what about me? So today, as we prepare to go to the cemetery, our brother Ed will be greatly missed. And we know that this is a painful period. I've lost both of my parents. I've lost friends. I've lost many members here in the church. And no matter how or when death comes, it's never easy. It's always a challenge, and it's always painful. So I can tell you today that you're not going to feel pain because I would be lying. Even though the Bible says that someone who dies in the Lord is actually a good thing. It says pleasant in the eyes of the Lord are the death of his saints. But even though we don't mourn as those who have no hope, we still feel the pain of loss. And so to Rosella and the kids and siblings and family members, I feel your pain. But there's an old saying that you hear many, many times. It says, weeping in jaws for the night, but joy comes in the morning. So you may feel pain now, but eventually time heals a lot of things. And that pain is going to be replaced by wonderful memories. We thank God that his life was such a life that we can all celebrate, we can be thankful for. So the question is today, what about you? Where do you go from here? I want us to stand together. And as we stand together, I want to do something. I want to provide you an opportunity. I don't want to take for granted that everyone here is a believer. But I just want to give you an opportunity today if you are not right with God to make things right. It doesn't cost you anything. You don't lose anything. But you gain a whole lot. So I just want you to bow your heads and repeat after me. Some of you may be praying this prayer for the first time. Others, this may be a rededication. But repeat after me. Father God, you made me. You programmed me. You had a design for my future. But Lord, I may have strayed away from your plan. And so today I come back to you. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to forgive me of my transgression. I ask you to come into my heart again to save me and fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can live the destiny that you planned for me. Lord, I thank you for guiding me, directing me, protecting me, and giving me eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to remain standing. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time today or you prayed it as a rededication, 
our ushers, they have some packages. There's a book that I wrote and some other material. The book is called, What Do I Do Now? Now that I'm a believer. And it's like a 13 step program. What are the 13 things that you need to do after you commit your life to Christ to help you to make it along the way? So if you'd like one of those packages, um, our ushers at the back, they're gonna, they'll give you one on the way out. You can collect that. But let's, let's, let's remain standing. And I just wanna say again, we thank God for our brother's life. We thank God for his memory. And we know that we will see him again. Amen. <laughs>